Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Matilda McQuaid. I'm Deputy Curatorial Director here at the Cooper Hewitt. And I'm also one of the um, four curators for the Triennial, which I hope you have seen. And if you don't, if you haven't seen it yet, come back. It, you have until January 9th to see it. Um, so before we get into the bulk of the evening, I just wanted to make a few announcements about tonight's program as well as some upcoming programs. Um, tonight's program and the exhibition National Design um, Triennial Y Design Now, um, which as I said is on view through January 9th, um, is sponsored by GE and we're incredibly grateful for their support of this exhibit and also um, the related programs. Um, I'd also like to thank Agnes Bourne, the Mondrian Foundation, and the Cultural Services of the French Embassy in the United States, La Maison Francaise, for its support of tonight's program and the exhibition. And in terms of um, next week, or this coming week first, if you want to know what's behind me, behind this panel, you got to come on Thursday. I'm not going to tell you what it is, except that um, the, it's part of Bill's design talks. Um, Professor Takamura is going to be talking about it, and it has to do with the earth. So you got to come. It's going to be a fantastic interactive event. The first time seeing this, I'll give you a hint, it's the earth. That's an interactive earth, and it's the first time um, that it's been in New York. Um, and then on the following Monday, we have a conversation with Bill and Alberto Alessi. So program information and tickets are online. And um, also, if you have any questions about any of them, Erin McCluskey, who's head of our public programming, is here this evening, and she can also answer them. So tonight, we're going to hear about materials. And they're not your ordinary materials. We are going to hear about some innovative thinkers and designers who are working with materials such as glass and flax and mushrooms. And these and hopefully many other materials are going to be um, talked about and can also be seen upstairs as well as um, at the end of the program on the table um, as you leave. Now, when I and my um, fellow curators began researching the triennial, um, I was the one in charge of pursuing materials. And so I knew exactly where to go. And I went to visit um, the material man himself, Andrew Dent, who's going to be our moderator tonight, and um, who lives and breathes materials, and who is the vice president at Material Connection, who is um, also the um, responsible for putting out these materials on the table tonight. And um, I came with him sort of with this idea that I wanted to find the miracle material, the one that was biodegradable, that, you know, no zero or zero carbon footprint, was affordable, beautiful, and all those other expectations that designers would love to have in kind of the miracle material. And he set me straight. <laughs> he said, there's no miracle material. And he kind of rejiggered my priorities and showed me some really beautiful, innovative materials, which um, we're going to share some of them with you tonight. So then um, the, another person who's going to be speaking tonight is, um, I think, considered another material man, Francois Osenborg. Maybe he's the material man of France. But he's also called the poet of materials. And um, I would even add to this title magician of materials, because he has this magical way of making materials unfold and unfurl, and generally just kind of exciting all of our senses. And his Lynn 94 chair, which is made out of 94% flax, is in the exhibition. And, um, and just by the way, it's as strong as carbon fiber. Um, Ice Stone is um, also represented in the show and um, a representative here to talk about um, they're sort of innovative materials. And what's so interesting about iStone when I visited is how they think very holistically. Um, they care as much about the educational training of their employees as about the quality of the materials they produce. 
And the quality of ice stones, recycled glass, and concrete slabs is absolutely gorgeous, as you'll see on the table. And coordinating this is <coughs> Daphna Alshe, who is helping to transform how manufacturers such as ice stone um, think and are producing. And finally, we come to mushrooms. Um, and I was amazed at the idea of mushrooms um, being used as insulation material, um, combined with other kinds of agricultural waste like rice hulls and cotton burrs and mushroom roots. So um, Eben Beyer, who is co-founder of um, a biomaterials company called Ecovative Design, is going to tell us more about this magical mushroom materials um, that we don't eat, but um, that we actually admire. So I'm going to let Andrew come up and give another little intro, and then um, the panelists will come up in a few minutes. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thanks, Matilda. Um, yeah, I'm the guy who you come to with all your hopes and dreams about materials, and I basically say you can't have it. <laughs> um, I think with, with Matilda and with our, um, our, uh, our uh, aiding her selections in, mater in materials for the show, I think what we tried to do was to try and give them an idea of there is probably, you're right, not one material which will solve all problems, but there are certainly plenty of materials that are able to solve specific problems. Um, and if you look at the materials within the show, uh, many of them are to do with sustainability. Uh, and I think it's impossible to think about materials and design at the moment without uh, thinking about sustainability as one aspect of what you need to solve in the problem of, of creating a, uh, a product that works. If you look at, if we think about a, a timeline of materials within the, um, from basically, let's say this, the start of the Industrial Revolution through to about now, we have we have seen how materials can completely transform our built environment. We've seen how uh, concrete and cement and then reinforced uh, concrete is able to create skyscrapers. We've seen how glass um, is able to allow us to see through uh, huge expanses of, of material. We've seen how some of the basic materials that started really on large production within the start of the 20th century are still carrying us through in this 21st century. There are many materials now which are not really that much different from those that were, that were used initially in, in, the, in the early 1900s. And I think if you chart then again through to the latter part of the 20th century, um, let's say from the 50s onwards around to about 2000, you start to see more the uh, inclusion of synthetic materials. So, we started with these building materials that are concrete and uh, cement, uh, uh, cement and steel and glass, and we see these skyscrapers, and we see that there is some value and some longevity to those. We then started, um, because of our desire for more products, of cheaper products, of uh, prettier products, of, of less expensive uh, um, uh, objects to, to own, we found that if we made things out of synthetics, out of oil, we were able to do this more cheaply, brighter colored, uh, a greater uh, variation in terms of, of styles and designs. And from the 50s on to about 2000, we had what was basically a synthetic period, a period where we believed that the best products would always come from materials that were synthesized by humans. So we kind of eschewed the natural world and said, OK, I want everything to be made out of plastic. And there are, if you look back at advertising or the sort of marketing that was done by companies who were promoting plastic materials, the belief was that we would, you know, we would live in this Jetsons world and it would be all plastic. Now, I think um, towards the end of the 20th century, we started to realize, well, maybe that's not such a good idea. Maybe we have uh, started to reap what we have sown in the use of synthetic materials. And I think, you know, examples such as the Pacific Garbage Patch, uh, some of the problems with the recycling of packaging, the fact that some plastics, although made out of organic materials, don't tend to go away for a long period, uh, for a long time, you know, 300 years, 500 years. So we're left with them, even though they may have only lasted a couple of seconds as a packaging material, they then last for hundreds of years, uh, either in a landfill or perhaps even out in our wilds. So end of, the, end of the 20th century, of course, we were hearing about the concerns about sustainability from the mid to late 60s onwards. But really, um, the last... 10 years of the 20th century and the first 10 years of the 21st century, we've really started to understand now the impact and effect of really all the materials that we use. 
So before we thought plastic's great, then we saw that perhaps it wasn't so great. But I think now, once we started to get worried about um, the effect of materials and the impact on our, on our planet, I think we now, then started to understand really what the impact of all materials was. And I think perhaps one of the greatest um, advancements in the world of materials has been a better understanding of what things cost the planet, what they cost our, uh, us as humans, how they affect us as humans. Um, and we have a better understanding now of, of every material that we use, what is the effect that material is going to have on the environment, on our health, uh, on the environment uh, um, of our children, our, our grandchildren. So we've seen material innovation, we've seen great strides in the use of carbon fibre, in the use of um, the, the, the burgeoning uh, area of nanotechnology, the improvements in, the, in metals. We've seen all these improvements, but I think one of the greatest advances we, we've had is that we can say now, if you want to produce something and you want to use a material, we can tell you what the effect of that material is. And I think what that has done is, is, is both put a curse upon all designers and also given them an awful lot of creativity. The initial curse, of course, is that everything you produce now has an impact. Everything that you, so the more successful you are in producing more products, the more impact it has. And we've seen through Cradle to Cradle um, as a design uh, methodology how it's possible to, to get around that. But the, the vast majority of current products in the direction they're going, um, in terms of you know, wanting to sustain um, greater profits and, um, and uh, larger volumes of production, it's very hard to actually then put sustainability into that and, and then have sust sustainability as an effective way of then uh, changing the production of those products. So we got a little depressed. The designers came to us and asked, well, well how then now do I make a product I can be proud of? So we have sustainability as that, um, uh, almost a break on, on production and makes designers think differently. But I think as designers then got a better understanding of the way that um, they can use sustainability, and I think examples of the materials that do show great sustainability will be presented here, I think, with uh, certainly with the, um, the, the products of uh, Francois Asenberg, uh, Ice Stone, as well as the, um, the, uh, the uh, mushroom material. I think we can see there how... how then understanding sustainability, how given those limitations, your creativity is then allowed to grow a little bit more. So with no constraints, you can make anything, then you, do, you need very little creativity. Where if you, put, if you put constraints within that and you need to make something which is, is sustainable, I think then you need to be more creative. Maybe the, there are greater limitations on the materials, but then that's up to you as a designer, as a producer, to work within those limits and then come up with something which does not only have sustainable um, attributes, but then is also um, a, a successful in, uh, in terms of, of profit in, and a success in terms of the, the beauty of the material as well. We are, of course, always concerned about resources as well. Uh, if you follow the news, there are concerns about rare earth elements, there are concerns about how much oil we have left. And I think, again, the materials that we are seeing uh, and we're going to talk about today uh, give an example of how one can reuse the millions of tons of glass that is recycled every year. We can also see how the waste material is also then allowed to be incorporated into a mushroom-based insulating material, again, using waste material um, rather than using re new resources. And, of course, the use of, th use of things like flax, which, again, in itself is a, is a waste material from linen production, how that can be used as an, an alternative to glass fibre or carbon, carbon fibre um, and have much the same property in terms of strengthening uh, and crea uh, creating beautiful objects. So I think with our concerns about resources, whether they be oil or natural materials, um, I think... These three um, products give a, uh, a great show as to how one can use uh, waste materials, recycled materials, to a very um, effective end. So uh, what we'll do next is I'm actually going to have Francois come, along, um, come up here and, and talk probably for about 10 minutes about some of his work. We will then sit down as a panel, and I'll have the two other panelists explain something about uh, their products and their processes in terms of sustainability. We'll have some, um, some questions, and then we'll open up to the, uh, to, to the floor. So... Francois, if you'd mind come up, coming up and uh, giving us a presentation, that'd be, be great. Thank you. Okay. Bonsoir, donc je suis François Azambour, de uh, Good evening, I'm François Azambour. Je tiens à remercier uh, le Copper Hewitt et Mathilde de m'accueillir ce soir, um, ainsi qu'Odile Henault, grâce à elle. I would like to thank uh, Mathilde for um, uh, her introduction this evening. 
Ok. Euh... Donc je vais par... je vais certainement vous parler. Um, I think that de... probably we're going to be speaking to you uh, tonight uh, a great deal about modern economy. Alors pour pour ce to go in that direction, this uh, this first uh, image, uh, uh, which is a combination of uh, fiber optics and iodine. Et donc, ce qui se passe dans ce luminaire, c'est qu'en fait... Just to show you uh, what makes it up, essentially, this is something that uh, uh, is reduced uh, to, its, uh, to its elements. So, uh, I think that if what we're talking about is sustainable development, we're going to have to talk about subtraction. Let's talk about that uh, then with respect uh, to a piece of furniture. What you have in a piece of furniture then is um, a, a structure, a filling, and a surface. J'ai oublié, mais je tiens vraiment à m'excuser de pas parler. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, I apologize that I'm not speaking English. <laughs> So what I have done, um, since we're talking about subtra subtraction, is that I have eliminated one uh, constituent part of this, which is to say the structure. And what you have less left is uh, foam and rubber. On top of this rubber, you've got uh, two layers of plywood. Sur ce procédé avec Hermès. Um, this is something that I did for Hermès. Uh, you have these attaché cases, um, which were conceived according to the same principle which I just showed you. Avec le même principe. Alors, this was quite a, a revolution for Hermès because normally what they do is that they have a frame of wood which they then cover with. Um, leather. Et donc les the people who work for Hermès had to learn how to now be working on a a movable structure, not a firm structure. Uh, it was uh, quite an argument. It just sort of went over for went on forever. Everybody yelling at me, uh, "Why did you remove the structure?" Alors moi je leur disais, c'est pour je leur ai expliqué. So I tried to explain to them that uh, in the old days you had somebody to carry your bags, but people who have Hermès bags today are carrying their own bags, and that means that they need something that's very light. C'était nécessaire de faire des bagages qui soient très légers. I see that uh, time is passing quickly, so I'm skipping over a few of these things. Um, this is something that I did in uh, 2005, and uh, evalu an evaluation of apartment decorating in Paris. Et donc travaillé sur un... What I was working on uh, here was quite interesting to me. It was um, a bee's uh, bed, that, such as you see in a, uh, you know, the different beds that the bees have in a, a beehive. Um, the reason this was interesting to me is because um, this is a twofold object. It is uh, both useful and beautiful. Alors j'avais fait une caisse en. I created just a simple uh, case with the, uh, with these bee beds. And I'll show you here uh, some of the um, component parts involved. I decided that I wanted to work with these uh, bee beds. And I came to the conclusion that uh, these uh, bee beds could also be, um, uh, lead me to create other kinds of objects. Uh, I'm going to also come back uh, a little later to the use of uh, wax uh, as, it, uh, uh, as it applies to this. Here you can see uh, these are little plates for holding fruit. What happened here, though, was uh, in, in working for, uh, as a designer for companies, I would make a decision. Um, but that decision would just sort of uh, disappear in the air because finally it was the bees that were making all the decisions. <laughs> one of the great worries that we have in design is how you can get yourself to move from one level to the other. And so it was very interesting to see how well the bees managed that. So when things really went well, I ended up with a little plate, such as you see here. And it was um, constructed with the same um, uh, method that you would use for a plaster mold. What happens is that um, we remove the, uh, the beeswax, and what we replace it with is uh, melted silver. De l'argent en fusion. Bon, j'en ai profité au passage. Um, what I'm uh, doing now is uh, just sort of uh, uh, going through a few slides which allow you to see objects that have been um, that I've been able to create from these uh, bee beds. Voilà, qui est édité par Lynn Rosé. What happened uh, next in my career was the Japanese uh, asked me to work for them. Il y a des Japonais qui m'ont demandé de travailler pour eux. 
And it's very interesting because they work beginning um, with a starting material of recycled paper. Tiny little pieces that they uh, retrieve from a uh, factory that makes envelopes. It was um, fascinating because the resin was um, stuck on to these little pieces of the envelopes. What's really fascinating is that uh, with these little tiny pieces of paper, they um, manage to fine-tune some pretty wonderful products. With the use of uh, all kinds of different materials, going from foam all the way to structures. And what we were doing was injecting paper inside. One of the things I'd like to mention is that you can actually build an entire house out of paper with this method. This is a flax field. This is a kind of a lovely story. One day an industrialist called me up and uh, he said, I am somebody who uh, makes chassis for very fine cars such as uh, Lamborghinis and Ferraris, etc. And uh, it asked me to, uh, to use then uh, coal and Kevlar. The desire was to uh, use this kind of material in a house, but that would be very difficult to do because it's very expensive, and besides that, it would be very difficult to obtain the material. And so um, the thought was that probably um, we, it would be much better to try to use natural uh, products, vegetable-based products. Bizarrement, il a dit, okay. And bizarrely, what did he say? Okay. And so uh, each one of us uh, went home and uh, did research for a couple of weeks and thought about it, and then we got back together again and said, uh, well, finally, um, among all the products that we can think of, the natural products that we might use, cotton and many others, we ended up um, with uh, flax as being the best option. And what's interesting is that our first experiment was on uh, automobile chassis. Even before we um, launched the manufacturing of the mold itself. Uh, right now this is called a 94 flax. This is because we ended up with 94% of vegetable material in the chair. And the 6% that's left are uh, oil-based products. Essentiellement durcisseur. Um, they serve essentially as hardeners. What was more complicated was using um, flax resin. It was a beautiful experience showing that today we can use new composites by uh, using essentially natural elements. On the other hand, um, uh, this is uh, high performance stuff because it's uh, twice as light as flax fiber. Je vais peut-être terminer là-dessus. And this is uh, kind of surprising. The, the chair, uh, the machine that uh, makes the chair, uh, weighs more than 10 tons. Um, this is a chair that I did about uh, 10 years ago called the PAC chair. But what's uh, wonderful about uh, this chair is that uh, it, it avoids uh, structure entirely. The chair suffices to itself. It makes itself. It's really simple. You buy the so-called pack. You take your chair out of the pack. You turn a button that is on the side of the chair, and that puts two polyurethane uh, components uh, together with one another, in contact with one another. And then you shake your chair, and it makes itself, it builds itself in four minutes. Voilà, ça c'est la chaise obtenue. Bon. Je crois que c'est bon. Oh là, il y a encore plein d'autres choses. Non, c'est pas grave. I think that's okay. That's it. Thank you. And initially, I'll have uh, Daphne from Eyestone and Evan from um, Greensillet uh, to actually kind of explain um, in a few minutes just uh, their material and kind of um, the reasons why they believe that their material was selected and, and is important for the, uh, the, um, uh, the exhibition uh, at the Cooper Hewitt. So, Daphne, please start. Um, so, Eyestone is a um, durable surface. And it is manufactured um, out of 100% recycled glass and cement. Um, Speak so loud. And uh, we manufacture everything in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so 
I think one of the reasons that we were chosen um, to be part of this exhibit is uh, that we are an example of manufacturing materials in the United States, um, employing 50 people with uh, local green collar jobs, and also this innovative material of combining glass and cement, which um, for many years people thought was not possible. Um, so beyond that, on the sustainability end, we're redirecting uh, millions of, of tons of glass um, from the landfill, as well as offering people an alternative to a petrochemical-based surface um, or a, a natural surface, which is, is mined. Okay. Does everyone know what ice stone is? Um, okay, so it's, um, uh, you, you should, I mean, if you don't have the book, obviously uh, we have images of it here. It's at the exhibition as well. It is a beautiful slab stone, uh, it was a, um, poured cement uh, slab which is polished, which is used for countertops. It's uh, a range of different colors. Mm -hmm. And when they polish it, the glass shines through, yes? Yes, so it's um, uh, precast cement, and um, it's sold in 35 square foot slabs, and, um, and then um, cut and installed in a kitchen, fireplace around, really any place that you could install marble or granite or um, any sort of quartz stone product. Okay. Thanks, Stefan. Sure. Hey, Evan. Well, uh, let me just tell you briefly, uh, what we do is we use mushrooms, or the root structure of mushrooms, uh, mycelium, is a resin. And in fact, it's one of the few or only resins on the planet that is totally biodegradable. It's, the it's organism it's itself is used as a resin. Um, I think what we're doing and how it relates to the exhibit on a higher level, though, is uh, a systems philosophy designing materials, particularly with a holistic view of how they fit into our natural environment. Um, and when we were first developing our innovation, uh, the three principles we sort of kept returning to were, how do we use multiple feedstocks from multiple locations, just like in nature? Uh, nothing runs off a single feedstock like you do to make plastics from petroleum. That was our first principle. The second principle is, how can you make things far more efficiently? And uh, with the kind of pressures we're seeing on our society, the growth of population, saving 10% of your energy during production really doesn't cut it. Uh, it's sort of like, you better not consume it at all. So we were really, really looking at how can we do leverages of one-fifth the energy or one-tenth the energy, an order of magnitude increase or reduction, depending on your perspective. And the last really key component, which I think often gets forgotten in considering what a sustainable material is, is what do you do when you're done with it? And that's why we actually launched in packaging, is because we thought it was such a great demo. Here you have a plastic, you mentioned this in your introduction. It's designed, it's designed to be used for 30 days or 60 days. It has the embodied energy of you know, a gallon of gasoline in some cases, and yet you throw it away and it'll last for 10,000 years. And so we said, well, how do you make a material that's designed to last for 60 days, and when you throw it away, that's actually, that's the upside for the material. And, and that's what we've done with ours, and I think that's why um, our material was uh, fit for inclusion in this exhibit. Um, has, anyone, has everyone seen that material as well? The kind of, uh, they actually have samples out here, so you can take a look at, um, uh, at the end of the uh, discussion. Okay, um, so obviously we're talking about materials. Um, it seems as though we have three, um, uh, three users of materials who have been creative in the way that they are using existing materials, um, using waste materials. But actually, um, if we are gonna uh, think about sustainability, I, maybe I, I'll ask uh, Daphna first. Um, Given that you've got this material which uses recycled glass, what was the company trying to improve upon? What, what was missing in existing solutions to that problem of creating a countertop or a, a, a marble alternative that you feel like Ice Stone solved? Well, um, you know, I think Ice Stone's interesting on many levels. So there's a human health level where, um, unlike uh, marble or granite, which can emit radon um, or a petrochemical-based surface, um, it emits no harmful VOCs. And so it, it's the healthiest countertop that you can really have in your kitchen. You can, there, there's, it emits nothing harmful. It has no petrochemical-based resins in it at all. Um, so that was one major improvement. Um, in addition to that, on the sustainability end, um, you know, we're, we're like I said, we're redirecting millions of tons of glass in um, in the United States from instead of going into the landfill, really being upcycled into this beautiful product. Um, and and in addition to that, um, you know, mining for 
granite and marble is, is a really invasive practice, um, often done in remote parts of the world, very far away from the United States. So offering an alternative that um, is manufactured in the US and doesn't require the, the, um, the environmental destruction of, of mining for, for marble and granite was really something that the co-founders were, um, were really striving okay. to achieve. Okay, Evan, a kind of a slightly different aspect to that question. Um, you've got this material, which is mushrooms plus um, waste products. It's insulative, it has, has a give to it. Okay, so what are the properties of existing insulation and packaging materials do you feel like you had to overcome or, or had to approach, and do you feel as though you've solved those problems? Uh, in comparison to our material? In, in, in comparison, let's take an, an, uh, another material typically used for insulation, whether it's glass fiber or some sort of uh, polystyrene, and same for packaging sure. as well. Well, I'll talk, let me talk a little bit about how we got to packaging, actually, and I think I can answer your question that way. Uh, so we've created a, a new material which didn't exist before, and one of your first challenges are, uh, what the heck to use this for, right? Um, and we, we struck upon insulation because it had insulative properties, it was fire resistant, and we said, look, this is a great application, foam insulation's bad, there's no alternative to it, we're gonna go after this. And we started getting into the market, we said, well, hey, okay, actually this product's used for 100 years. Um, this is might not, th this isn't great to use plastic here, but it's not the worst place this plastic's being used. This same plastic is being used in protective packaging for 60 days, one of our great strengths is that we fit into nature's recycling system. Let's launch in that market where we can really have the biggest benefit. And it turns out there are some different properties, including density. We're a bit denser than a conventional packaging material. And that's where the designers come in. Because the designers have to then design, you can't do a one-to-one -one substitution. You have to you make design choices about geometry, about crush zones, et cetera. Um, but what we found in our working with customers is we're almost always able to get to the same performance uh, criteria, even if the design is not exactly identical. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, Francois, slightly different again for you. Um, in the use of natural materials, uh, flax, um, the, the decision to use the material, was it, was it because it was just available, or do you feel as though the use of natural materials is essential in the work that you do? Does it need to be natural, or just did the, did the flax material work for what you needed? Oh, that's good. As far as, as, far as flax goes. Euh, non, c'est comme j'ai expliqué au dé, le, le lin, on ne savait pas du tout les, les performances que ça allait avoir euh, au départ. On ne savait pas du tout où on allait. We didn't. We. Is this off? No. We didn't know. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear anyway? Um, we really didn't know what uh, it was going to uh, produce, what was going to happen in the beginning with flax. We didn't know if it was going to work or not. Mais euh, ça me semble être. Euh, Um, j'ai beaucoup de mal en fait à utiliser enfin um, ce qui se passe souvent c'est que les, les gens sont très paresseux et, et, et donc prennent les, les solutions qu'on a les, les solutions les plus simples um, what happens very often is that people um, are kind of lazy and so they will go after the easiest solution possible alors qu'au fond avec euh, d'autres solutions qui peuvent être avec les matériaux euh, naturels so fundamentally now with other solutions um, using natural products on, on a quand même la, poss la possibilité de proposer quelque chose de neuf we, what we have is the opportunity to propose something new et, et, et souvent euh, par cette recherche euh, les réponses qu'on obtient vont beaucoup plus loin que celles qu'on pouvait imaginer. And uh, very often, if you just push this uh, in the direction of this uh, research, the responses that you get are much more imaginative than you could have, than you could have um, supposed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and did the, um, the production process um, of the LIN-94, did it differ a lot from using carbon fiber? Did you have to have a different production process than you would have used with a more standard composite? Alors, le procédé pour, uh, pour le lin, est-ce que c'était un procédé bien, uh, très, très différent de ce que vous auriez pu uh, utiliser avec uh, un, un produit normal qui s'utilisait mm. uh, Non, non, en fait, le, le procédé, il, il, est, il est très proche de ce que de, si on avait utilisé de la fibre de verre, de la fibre de carbone ou de la fibre de Kevlar, 
Euh, on, on avait quasiment le, le, le même procédé. As a matter of fact, the process was actually uh, practically the same, whether we're using fiber or flax. C'est ce qu'on pensait au début. Um, at least that's what we thought in the beginning. Voilà. Uh, le, 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 le... <laughs> C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, euh, euh, je crois que c'est la grande difficulté à utiliser des matériaux naturels, c'est qu'ils ne sont pas calibrés. The big difficulty in using natural products is that they're, they're not calibrated. Mm -hmm. Alors que l'industrie utilise de la fibre de verre qui est parfaitement calibrée. Whereas in, in the industry, for example, you're using glass fiber that is perfectly calibrated. Donc quand, quand elle fait un act une action, elle sait exactement ce qu'elle va obtenir. So when you perform a certain action, you know exactly what you're going to obtain. Mm -hmm. Et donc, euh, quand on utilise des matériaux naturels comme le lin, c'est euh, beaucoup plus compliqué d'arriver de, 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 à... Enfin, la, la recherche et le développement sont beaucoup plus compliqués. Research and development are much more complicated. Okay. Notamment, alors pour en finir avec le lin, euh, on a eu des, des, des difficultés à la fois parce que le lin reprend énormément l'humidité. Um, so to finish our discussion on flax, uh, in the beginning we had a lot of problem because um, flax absorbs enormous quantities of humidity. Mm -hmm. Et y a des être très année sur And that means that you can have a, um, a, a yield that is very, very different from one year to the next. Okay. And perhaps since we're talking about natural materials and them being uh, not as exact and controlled as synthetics, okay, you're growing things. How does one then make sure that you can grow into the exact right product size? And, and do you have a lot of variation? I was trying to, I was trying to decide whether or not we avoid that problem or not, because the incoming uh, ag waste we grow on is extremely variable. Uh, the benefit of a growing organism is it actually is, is fairly tolerant to this variation. Uh, but the net result is, yeah, Uh, we do have to deal with the natural variations you'd see in any living creature. And um, luckily, fungal mycelium is a very uh, unit-based cell organism. It's a lot like yeast. So bakers and breweries have used yeast for thousands of years, and your beer essentially tastes the same every time you drink it. Uh, you get on the edges in wine. You, you actually see where that, those natural flavors come out. But uh, with this organism, through quality control, we're actually able to control that process pretty well. But today, it's not as consistent as a plastic would be. Um, okay, Daphne. Um, you're basically producing, it's an event, you're local based, you're Brooklyn. Um, you are producing something which obviously which has an awful lot of weight. In terms of trying to um, present a sustainability story, how does one deal with the fact that you're producing something in Brooklyn which then may get shipped to all places of the, of the US? Is that something that has been of concern to iStone? And have you thought about find, finding different, more, more localized production in other areas? Or is it, it, what is it, what's the effect of the transport and the weight of the product? Absolutely, and um, that problem led us to the distribution model that we have, which is we have regional distribution throughout the United States and the major metropolitan areas. And we, max, we optimize the truckloads going to California to our distributors um, and sending it you know, once a month. Um, so they stock inventory of the material. And then they, from there, they distribute locally to their fabricators and their designers in, in, you know, in California, in Texas, in Chicago, all over the country. Um, but this is, this is a big question, and, and it's a big question for us to consider as we grow in the United States, whether it would make sense to maybe build a manufacturing facility in the West Coast, and as we roll out globally, um, you know, thinking about manufacturing facilities around the world that can really reuse the recycled glass from that area to make local ice stone um, in, the, in that region of the world. Because so. isn't that, that, isn't that the idea of concrete, is that concrete is essentially a local product. Absolutely. Um, do you, but with yours, you're having recycled glass. Is the assumption that recycled glass is going to be the same no matter where you produce it? So um, it, that's a good question. And actually, in the United States, the infrastructure to recycled glass is not as great as it is in Europe. Um, so in, in the United States, we throw our bottles away um, into a recycling bin, and they're not sorted, which actually makes it um, worthless. It's valueless. So if the glass isn't sorted by color, it can't be remelted and, and then reused. 
Whereas in Europe, if we opened a, a manufacturing facility in Europe, they actually, most European countries, sort their glass. So um, there are regions of the world where it would probably be easier for us to manufacture ice stone. Um, but part of, of our mission is really um, not only to make these beautiful surfaces, but to teach people about um, sustainability and, and really um, help influence policies in regard to glass recycling. So. Uh, Francois, um, I was looking at some of the um, some of the images in your presentation, and the use of, of honeycomb or uh, bee beds, as you'd call them. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, was uh, is to a designer or an engineer is a very important aspect of a lot of modern engineering, which is to look at the way nature approaches certain problems. It is known as uh, bionics in Europe or, or biomimicry here in the US. <coughs> when think when approach is that your approach to look at the way that nature solves problems and then to use that information in the designs, or is it more a visual and tactile effect of of what of, of what you're experiencing? So, is it a problem solving that you're getting from the from the bees, or is it just an aesthetic? You're asking me some pretty complicated questions. It depends. It depends. Euh, pour les abeilles, comme je disais, enfin, ce qui est intéressant chez les abeilles, c'est que c'est des ouvrières. What's interesting about bees is they're workers. Non syndiquées. Uh, they don't have a union. Et qui <laughs> travaillent tout le temps. Et And they, so they work all the time. On a beaucoup de problèmes comme ça. Hein. <laughs> et, euh, donc ça m'intéressait en fait d'utiliser les, les abeilles pour fabriquer quelque chose. So I was interested therefore in using uh, bees in order to um, manufacture something. Voilà. Après, j'ai quand même l'impression que euh, c'est intéressant de, de, de comprendre plus finement que, comment, les comment la nature produit des choses. And then, um, secondly, uh, I think it's uh, so interesting to understand on a much finer level how nature produces things. Et, et ça pose les choses de manière essentielle. And, um, uh, I would say that that's even the essential question. Donc sur la question des abeilles, comme moi je suis aussi fasciné par euh, la fabrication des objets et euh, l'industrie. Since I am somebody who is also fascinated by um, the uh, manufacture of products within industry. Je, ce qui, ce qui m'intéressait, c'est pas tellement que les abeilles fabriquent quelque chose, mais c'est que nous, en, en, pu, en plus, on puisse le, le, le traduire autrement avec un dans un geste industriel. So what, uh, what interested me was uh, less the fact that bees actually produce something, but um, rather uh, how we could take their method of working and turn it into an industrial gesture. Et pour en finir, euh, donc j'ai travaillé avec des gens qui font des moulages euh, qui sont à, à côté du Mans en France et qui fabriquent des Formule 1. Et c'est avec eux que j'ai réussi à faire des moulages euh, des gens qui... Qui, fa qui fabriquent des moteurs de, de, de Formule 1, oh, okay. des mouleurs. OK. Um, I, so I was working next to people who were um, uh, making molds de Formule 1. Formule 1, euh, next car. En... What is that? Oh, just plain old Formula One. Oh, I was looking for something much more. Thank you very much. <laughs> much more esoteric. Formula One. Uh -huh. Et eux m'ont expliqué qu'au fond, avec cette technique, ils pourraient très bien euh, demander à des abeilles de fabriquer des, des radiateurs pour les voitures. And um, they explained to me how you could uh, request the bees that they make radiators for cars. Parce que, parce que les abeilles vont pouvoir fabriquer des formes extrêmement complexes avec beaucoup de facilité. Because bees are capable of making extremely complex forms with great facility. So the bees make the molds for the radiators for the cars? Donc ce sont les abeilles qui font les, les moules pour les radiateurs. Non, des... non, non, c'est plus simple que ça. No, it's simpler than that. C'est-à-dire que en, dans, dans une ruche, puisqu'il faut expliquer qu'on met la forme dans une ruche, donc la forme du, du radiateur est mise dans une ruche, et les abeilles euh, euh, fabriquent les, alvé les, 
les éléments de refroidissement du radiateur. Les éléments du radiateur. Wow. The elements of the radiator. Wow. <laughs> Donc en fait, elle, elle travaille à notre place. So the effect is that they are working instead of us. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Valley Union. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Evan. Uh, okay, you've got this ideal. A okay. Let's accept that sus true sustainability is very hard to obtain because you're always going to have some impact. You have a product which uses virtually no light. Um, grows on its own, you have a very low energy impact and very low impact process. How does one improve on that? How are you looking to basically make a better product, a more sustainable solution? Well, I think uh, you started with the right point, which is uh, unless you're dead, you have an impact, and uh, we have to accept that. Um, or you don't, but that has a short conversation usually. Uh, <laughs> there are two big energy users we still have in our process. Uh, we have to clean the material coming in such that only our organism grows on it and we have to dry the material at the end. And moisture removal is not a low energy process. Um, even with that included, we still do far better than conventional plastics. Um, we have a research project with the National Science Foundation to actually use the same uh, essential oils that plants create, things like thyme oil and sage oil, which are natural antifungal, antibacterial agents as a disinfection process. Mm -hmm. And we have two goals. One, reduce energy consumption in our process. And two, simplify the process such that anyone can do it anywhere in the world using their local materials. Our vision is you take the material, you mix in the plant essential oils, you add the cells, and you make it into whatever form or shape you need. Mm -hmm. okay. um, do you expect that to be, I mean, so you're seeing that uh, in the next couple of years? Is it sort of, what, what's the timeline for that? Uh, we've proven that you can disinfect uh, substrates more uh, or far more effectively than using steam, using these natural compounds. And now we're developing an organism that, that will grow in the presence of them, so mm -hmm. you don't remove them. Uh, so sometime in the next 12 to 36 months, um, we'll have something like that available. And um, improvements in the process on basically making cement um, you've got a relatively, you know, you, you've been in basically in the sustainability, you've been producing a low impact recycled product mm. for the last 10, 15 years? So, uh, went to, it, ISON was founded in 2003, went to market in 2005. Okay, so, so okay, so we're, we're in five years. Mm -hmm. um, but how does one then improve on that? How, um, what are the approaches you can make? So, um, I think, you know, about 30% of the product is still cement, which is um, very energy intensive to, to make. And, and as a company, we're not really um, tied to cement. So some of the research that, that we're working on and excited about is what kind of alternative material can we use as, um, as a matrix, as a binder for the glass that isn't as energy intensive is that recycled cement or different kind of product altogether that, that we don't know about yet. So, um, and then in addition to that, I think as, in, as a process, really thinking about our w reducing our waste. Um, so either by incorporating it back into the product or creating other products from the, the waste that we generate from our process. Okay. Um, okay, uh, you have cradle to cradle certification. Uh, does everyone know what cradle to cradle certification is? Cradle to cradle is a, uh, is a sustainability methodology which um, is probably one of the most rigorous and chemistry based uh, ways of approaching the um, environmental impact of a product. Um, it was uh, initially created by an architect, Bill, Bill McDonough, and a chemist. Uh, Michael Braungart, and they have been uh, certifying products um, probably in the last 10 years. Um, and they are, their type of certification is similar to life cycle analysis or, or um, uh, processes which try and, um, the, the standard international recognized processes which actually assess environmental impact. But they understand that um, in their methodology that if you really are going to have a truly sustainable product, um, you need something which in some way at the end of its life is able to be produced into something else. So um, standard environmental impact assessments, they look at the end of life, but it's not essential. Cradle to Cradle says, well, you really do need something to um, be made out to this at, at the end of its life. It is an understanding that rather than going from cradle to grave, which is the most standard products, Cradle to Cradle suggests that it goes within 
um, a continuous loop. And um, they have um, certified a range of different products, predominantly those within interior design, but they've also rolled it out to cities. There's a, a city in the Netherlands that is actually trying to um, order its own um, infrastructure based upon cradle-to-cradle -cradle principles, trying to throw nothing away, trying to make sure that everything is within a closed loop. And most recently, uh, Schwarzenegger has actually been trying to impl imp uh, implement certain cradle-to-cradle -cradle um, uh, methodologies in the state of California. So it's predominantly currently for products, but can also be rolled out into the whole of, uh, the whole of life. So you have this certification. Um, is it tough to obtain? And what are the processes? And um, what does it force you to do in terms of improvement in, sure. in the future? So we are cradle to cradle certified gold, um, and we are the only durable surface um, with that certification. And really, um, from going from silver to gold, it was phasing out all of the um, very, we had very few low toxic pigments, but we had to phase all of those out. So, um, which meant eliminating some colors and finding uh, non-toxic pigments to use. Um, so there's no toxins in the, in the product now. Um, and in terms of how we reuse the, our waste right now, um, so all of the samples that architects and designers order from us are actually um, material that's second quality that has been made into these samples. Um, and in addition to that, the, the waste that we generate right now is ground up and made into, made into roadbed. Um, but the idea for this next year um, is really thinking about beyond roadbed, what can we do with this, with this waste that we have. Got any good ideas? Um, well, there's the idea of whether we can put it back into the product. Mm -hmm. So can we grind it up and figure out a way to put it back in? Um, and some other ideas is, you know, can we collaborate with some furniture makers or some product designers to be able to incorporate this, this cement product in, into the things that they're doing, so. Okay. Now, uh, Evan, um, so obviously, if you think about cradle to cradle, um, your material is probably an ideal candidate, but I'm probably more, I mean, and if you w were to go that way, I'm sure it would, uh, you'd probably find it relatively easy to, to, to get within that certification. But well, you'd be surprised. Oh, okay. The, the, chem <laughs> the chemistry behind mycelium is unknown, so it actually is an example of a, a something without, outside of a system. Well, that's what I was thinking. I mean, um, do people get concerned about that something that's essentially, is, is it a growing object? Is it still growing? Well, not when you receive it. Okay, no, so, it's, so. It's inactive when it leaves the facility. <laughs> so if you work for us, we'll let you bring one home and you can watch it. <laughs> so are, are there concerns amongst people you present this to that it, because it's a natural material, because it has this very, it basically looks like mushroom. It, it has a very sort of natural feel to it. Are they concerned that that's gonna be a problem in use? Uh, initially, it's often a question we get. In fact, we've just gone through uh, a whole series of customs questions about can we import the material, and it went all the way up to the top levels of the, the USDA, and the answer came back finally, well, of course you can. It's an inert chitin and, and seed husks. This is totally fine, but okay. so if we hadn't started out by saying, oh, we make this for mushrooms, I, th I think it would have gone really smoothly, but uh, it's probably best we did because eventually someone was going to ask that. Um, and I just want to say on, on Cradle to Cradle, I think th the vision is excellent. And we actually uh, have spoke to them about certification because uh, we fit really well. And when it came down to what are the ingredients and what are the chemistry, we actually had a, 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 an inability to communicate because we said, well, what we put in is these cotton seed hulls and rice hulls, but what we get out the other end is chitin. And they said, well, how is that possible? They said, well, there's this organism that does it. And there's, there was, it just hadn't been considered before. Mm -hmm. So I think they're actually working on finding ways of adopting materials made in this novel process. I mean, I think the bees would be another example of how do you describe the chemistry of what's happening in that process? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, perhaps a final wrap-up question uh, to Francois then. Um, incredible materials you've worked on. What's your next favorite material that you want to, uh, you want to use? Um, en fait, uh Je ne travaille pas forcément avec un matériau, mais plutôt avec une association de techniques. Um, I work less with a material per se than a combination of techniques. Uh, je, je pense qu'il faut re-questionner aujourd'hui la manière dont on fabrique les objets. I think you have to challenge today the manner in which we produce uh, objects, create objects. Uh, oui, parce que je, je crois qu'en ce moment, on, a, on, vit, on vit une étape où on essaye de remplacer des, par des matériaux naturels, des matériaux non naturels. 
uh, we are um, we're we're going through a stage now where we're trying to uh, replace uh, materials that are not natural with natural ones. Voilà. Donc, et pour répondre à votre question, euh, en ce moment, nous, nous travaillons avec le laboratoire à Paris avec euh, David Edwards. But to, um, uh, to answer your question, we're working with a laboratory in Paris right now with uh, David Edwards. Qui est un chercheur à Harvard, avec Dunningberg. He is a Harvard researcher together with Dunningberg. Et en fait, on, sait que, on, se, on se pose la question de, de, de fabriquer une bouteille euh, naturelle. And uh, the problem that we're putting uh, before ourselves now is that of um, um, creating a bottle. Making a bottle. Pour lutter justement contre ces bouteilles en plastique qui utilisent de pétrole et qu'on arrive, qu'on a du mal à recycler. Uh, and we're trying to find something that can replace the plastic bottle which uh, uses petrol. Donc on a créé une bouteille qui est en donc la réponse, ce serait uh, l'alginate. Our answer to this is uh, alginate. Euh, Puisqu'on utilise de, de l'alginate qui, qui se pétrifie dans dans, dans dans un bain de chlorure de sodium. Mm -hmm. um, uh, alginate becomes petrified when it is put in a bath of sodium chloride. Et donc on est en train de créer une bouteille. Alors en général une bouteille on, on la remplit d'eau. Usually um, a bottle is something you fill with water. Là c'est le contraire qui se passe, c'est-à-dire qu'on crée autour de l'eau une membrane d'alginate qui se solidifie au contact euh, de chlorure de sodium. We're doing the, a different uh, thing. What we're doing is um, The bottle, which is uh, created when the uh, alginate creates a, uh, a membrane, um, which becomes hardened, therefore creating the <coughs> bottle, um, when it's got this sodium chloride bath. Et techniquement, je ne sais pas si j'ai le temps de répondre. Là. Um, do I have time to answer this question, technically speaking? Yes, of course. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, yes, we have time. We, 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 we're going to, but, um, uh, te so audience questions. Techniquement, on a, on a donc. Uh, une espèce de diaphragme so, uh, actually what we have is a kind of a diaphragm, qui s'ouvre et qui se ferme which, de manière à créer les, la forme de la bouteille. Which opens and closes so that it creates the shape of the bottle. Un peu comme un saucisson en fait. A little bit like a sausage. <laughs> Sauf que ce qui est intéressant, c'est que c'est la pression du liquide à l'intérieur qui donne la forme de la bouteille. What's interesting is it's the uh, pressure um, of the, this internal membrane that gives the shape to the bottle. Et je crois que c'est la première fois qu'on finalement on arrive à créer un objet dans un milieu aquatique. I think this is the first time that we have managed to uh, create an object in an aquatic milieu environment. J'ai quelques images, mais on n'a pas eu le temps de les voir. Ah, I, I have a picture of it, but um, I didn't have time to show you. Okay, well, um, thanks. Uh, okay, so um, I think we actually have enough time for um, some audience questions. Uh, well, for ice stone, is, um, once it's put into a home and used as a countertop surface, What happens when you demo it and it becomes, does it go back into the waste stream or can you recycle it or where does it go? Can, did everyone hear that question? Because that, that, that was, okay, if we can hear questions okay then that's fine. So yes, please, sorry. Um, so uh, right now we are working on figuring out some sort of, you know, I don't want to say buyback, but some take back method of figuring out, well, you know, if, if you're, um, nearing the end of your kitchen's life, what do you do with this product? So it's actually something that we're trying to develop and figure out, you know, there, each slab is 570 pounds, so does it make sense to ship it back to Brooklyn? Probably not, but can we figure something else out where, where it can be um, recycled locally or, or some, some sort of situation like that? So it's something that we're working on right now, yeah. Yes. I was just wondering, I... I really like all these ideas and principles, and but I personally I think mostly about clothing, and I was wondering if like any of these ideas, whether it's like how to make these structures or um, growing things, like if you could imagine maybe how these principles could apply to clothing, as opposed to like furniture or houses. Okay, so the question was, um, how do any of these the um, Insulated material, the ice stone, um, some of uh, Francois' ideas, how, how might they translate to clothing? Uh, I'll start. I would say at a high level, I think uh, clothing today is pretty poor compared to what it could be. If you think of an animal, it's, it's fur, how uh, reactive many animals' outer skins are. Um, so 
rather than saying we can grow mycelium clothing, I, I'd rather ask the question of, of how do we make clothing that behaves more like a fur that's reactive to your environment. And I think it's very possible, it's becoming very possible to do that with technology. <laughs> I'm, yeah. not sure, I'm not sure how you'd answer that yeah, one. <laughs> I, mean, I guess there's a couple of things, right? There's the, <coughs> I'm thinking about what kinds of fibers are we using on our clothing. So is it, you know, can we use more recycled content? And, um, and I think more than that, actually, um, was listening to a lecture about this, uh, you know, the, once you have the clothing, um, the, a lot of the energy goes into washing, laundering the clothing. So how can we create materials that um, don't require that kind of energy use uh, on the, on the, like once a consumer has it? So I think those are kind of interesting principles to think about. Moi, je me souviens d'une expérience qu'avait fait Honda, qui avait recouvert une, qui avait fait une carrosserie de voiture en, en avec, un, avec une fausse fourrure qui ressemblait à un ours polaire mouillé. Um, I'm thinking of a, uh, what this reminds me of is an experiment that uh, Honda did where they were, um, they covered a, the chassis of a car with a fake fur. Donc ça, ça posait effectivement la, la, la question de, de la carrosserie automobile, et donc de la couverture. So they, that was the, the problem they were posing, uh, covering. C'est un peu cette question qu'on s'est posée quand on a fait la, la chaise Lin 94, c'est-à-dire qu'on a des techniques qui sont issues de l'automobile. So that was really, it was actually the same question that we were asking when we uh, produced uh, Flax 90, 94 Flax or Flax 94. Um, et donc aujourd'hui on a l'effet inverse, c'est-à-dire qu'au fond comme on utilise du lin et qu'avec le lin on faisait de la lingerie, Um, we uh, we're working in the opposite direction now, uh, using flax, but c'est-à-dire en nageant pour la natation, la lingerie. L lingerie. Ah, la lingerie. Um, le... Lingerie. Yeah, but, uh, lingerie. En quel sens? C'est-à-dire euh, utiliser. Non, le, le, le lin, on l'utilise pour faire de la lingerie. Ah, oh, okay. Ça donnait le nom d'ailleurs de la lingerie. Okay. The the reason that we call. Um, um, High class underwear, lingerie, is uh, from the first three letters, lin, which are from uh, flax. Okay, so it is used to make that. Tout, tout ça pour dire que aujourd'hui, on, on est en train de se, se, de, se demander, je, parce que je, <laughs> on est en train de se demander si euh, les, les, la technique qu'on utilise avec le lin pour faire de la dentelle, par exemple, ne pourrait pas aller sur, sur les, les carrosseries automobiles. And so we're, uh, I'm getting at it in a very roundabout way, but what we have been asking ourselves is that the technique that has been used in order to make uh, lacy things can't be used actually to make the uh, cover of a car, the De, chassis of a car. Voilà, enfin, pour répondre à la question, on pourrait imaginer dans un temps futur que, le, que nos vêtements influencent le milieu automobile. So um, it, I've sort of come in the back door on this question. What we're imagining is that uh, Uh, in the future, uh, it is actually clothing that will mm. influence um, the cars. Voilà. Mais euh, plus simplement, euh, pour répondre à la question, euh, faire des vêtements, c'est pas très compliqué. Uh, but to answer your question, um, it's not very complicated to make clothing. On aura beaucoup plus de, 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 de problèmes aujourd'hui à, à déconstruire, euh, par exemple, euh, des ordinateurs portables. C est, c est, le problème, il est vraiment là. Il n'est pas vraiment dans, dans, le, dans le vêtement. The, uh, our Yes. Cement very difficult to put together. How how did you overcome that problem? And 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 secondly, uh, uh, the glass that you, you talked about the, the, the different types of stream. Do you use all type of colors glass? And if not, how do you separate those? Sure. Um, so to answer your first question, um, the way that we've been able to merge glass and, and cement into a new material um, is a combination of some proprietary ingredients and. and um, a process that we, we use, so unfortunately I can't divulge too much. Um, on, 
currently most of the glass that we get is post-industrial glass, which means that it's basically the waste from um, you know glass factories, bottle factories, and the reason that we it's easier for us to use the post-industrial glass is one, it's abundance, and two, um, it, it's clean and it's sorted. Um, so you know, part of the mission of Ice Stone, like I said, is to move away from using post-industrial glass and really influencing policy and influencing infrastructure to be able to use more post-consumer glass um, by you know, helping create glass processing facilities that, that can um, either sort the glass or influencing municipal policy where in New York City, instead of putting all of your glass in, in one recycling bin, maybe you have a sorted recycling bin. Um, because if we, could re, you know, if we could use the glass in New York City, that would be enough glass for us to make our ice stone. So um, yeah, that's where we are. So you just use the, the white glass? So oh oh um, so we have we have clear glass and then um, which you'll, if you see the product most of the material uh, most of the glass that you see in the product is actually the superficial level like concrete there's lots of layers of glass and it's 75, 70 to seventy five percent glass um, most of the glass is clear glass and then we do have some specialty glass some of which is um, post industrial waste from stained glass manufacturers. Uh, you know, beer bottles, um, and some of it which is actually remelted clear glass that's dyed. Um, yes. I'm just curious, um, I'm learning about these things, and I obviously don't know a lot about materials, but I'm trying to learn, and I was curious what, if there are places that you all get your information, because you all know very much, and like, whether it's like, books or websites or blogs or whatever, like how do you continue to learn about all these new developments or get ideas? That's uh, Francois. Um, uh, um, so the question was basically, um, for someone who is not very knowledgeable about materials, how does one learn? What's the quickest way? What's the, what's the best way? How have you, how have you learned? <laughs> <laughs> Look around yourself, or all around, you know. Okay. Ah, material connection. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay, okay, then, then, uh, then perhaps oh. it, um, Eb Eben, then, uh, in answer to that, um, what got you into it, and how did you basically then learn about um, the product? How did you learn to actually produce it and, and work with it? Uh, your answer is very fitting. Um, so this is, uh, my particular project was influenced by my experience actually growing up on a farm in Vermont where I saw mycelium running across the forest floor and then uh, what I was exposed to in school and being exposed through blogs and people coming in giving presentations about sustainable materials and it, it was the fusion of saying, I understand plastic resins are used all around us, maybe this is another kind of resin we can use. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, often the way to find innovation in material space or any space is to take something and put it in a new context and see how it behaves. Um, I'm going to go back to the mushrooms. Um, how do you grow it? I mean, what, what kind of, what is it in? Like, are you, do you have like a, does it have to be dark? So we, we have a, an 8,000 square foot warehouse, our first facilities in Green Island, New York. Um, and uh, we have a small portion of the warehouse where we, we process the ag materials. And they, they get cooked and cleaned and, and put in molds. And then these molds get stacked on four foot by four foot pallets. And they get palletized, uh, three to four layers in the air. And then we shut the lights off. And we go away for five days. And we come back, they've turned white. We pop them out. We put them in the oven. Uh, in reality, actually, people are running around all the time. And the lights are generally on. But it's for the people, not the mushrooms. <laughs> question is, um, I'm a package designer, so I'm so totally oh, cool. amazed by that. But are you finding new ways to mold it? Or can you form it in all different ways? And can you have different like degrees of rigidity yet? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the platform is really tunable. It just actually changing the organism, the type of mushroom we use, you get like, a, you can go from like a hard surface finish to like a felt velvety surface finish. Uh, and we can mold it into basically uh, any shape. And we're really trying to push the, push the limits on that. But it's still very early. I have a question just about kind of the collaborative, I assume it's collaborative design process. Like how did you even, I mean, who's on your team, Evan, and also at Ice Stone and Francois? I mean, how, 
I know that there's so much knowledge, you know, within you, but yet there's, I'm sure there's lots of consultants or, <coughs> so what is your process? Uh, well, I'll say starting out, our biggest advantage uh, in approaching biology was that we knew nothing about biology. Uh, so myself and co-founder of the company, Gavin McIntyre, both mechanical engineers. So we sort of went, in, went at this like, all right, we know your little machines. <laughs> how, do, how do we get you to do what we need? Um, and that's a, that's a different perspective. Um, and we have a lot of mechanical engineers on our team. Uh, we've got folks that actually studied mechanical engineering, got design degrees from Stanford, uh, came back to the field that bring a design uh, perspective. Our, our chief engineer has that background. Um, and um, I met a lot of biologists too. And all the way from conventional lab trained biologists to our mycologist, Sue Van Hook, who, who is very much into listening to what nature has to say and will come in and say, this is, you know, I've listened to the fungi and this is my insight. And quite often that will either be a key insight or will, will spark another discussion. So I think, uh, once again, the value and in innovation comes from disparate views. So we How big is your team? About 16. Who is funding your R&D? Uh, the US government uh, and private industry. So our team, um, so like I said, we were about 50 employees. Um, you know, we have um, process engineers, material engineers. Um, we have an engineering director who's a civil engineer. Um, but a lot of the innovation in terms of process really comes from the people on the floor who actually touch and handle the material every day. And, and what we are working on is really implementing a uh, lean manufacturing operating system, which um, is also known as the Toyota production system, um, in, in helping train and equip our employees with tools to solve their own problems. Because who better to solve a lot of our process problems and a lot of our quality problems than the people who are actually touching and working and feeling the material every day. So um, a lot of the innovation actually comes from them. I must say our team is really diverse. So um, we have Tibetan speaking employees, Spanish speaking employees, Slovak employees, American employees, Caribbean employees, um, which I think also helps generate different kinds of ideas. Euh, L'équipe, je crois, je crois qu'une des difficultés aujourd'hui du design, c'est justement d'arriver à constituer rapidement des équipes. I think that one of the problems with design today is the difficulty that there is in, in uh, putting together a team. Uh, voilà. Et, et uh, pour donner un exemple. I'll pour, give you an example. Uh, donc pour, uh, pour l'expérience qu'on fait avec les bouteilles. Uh, as far as the bottle experience goes. Uh, C'était d'autant plus compliqué qu'il y avait des chercheurs qui étaient aux états unis pas toujours en France. Um, one of the difficulties was that uh, some of the researchers were in the United States, not in France. Et, et donc, il y avait des chimistes, euh, des, des, des chercheurs, en, enfin, en, des scientifiques. So there were chemists involved, researchers, uh, various des, scientists. Euh, des artistes, des graphistes. Artists, graphic designers. Euh, quoi d'autre What else Et des mécaniciens. Enfin, des gens qui fabriquent, uh, mec, uh, um, des ingénieurs. That were those who put the thing Et finalement, on était uh, à peu près une, une, plus d'une vingtaine. Uh, finally, there were, we had a team of about 20 people. C'est tout. That's it. <laughs> yes. Uh, is, yes. 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 Uh, in your view, is Cradle-to-cradle certification system, the most widely accepted and, and rigorous method for ecological, uh, measuring ecological performance, or are there other ways that are, maybe, that are newer that, that you're interested in? Um, it's not the most widely used. Uh, the most, most widely used is the international standard ISO 14000. Um, this is recognized globally and is a um, uh, used by uh, interior designers, product designers, uh, companies wishing to improve the efficiency of their, of their systems. Cradle to Cradle is the most complete and the most, if you, if you read it, you think, okay, this is the future, this has to be the future. However, Cradle to Cradle has sometimes come up against, um, in order to use Cradle to Cradle effectively, you either need to have a product which is easily adaptable to that or, or would fit within their system, or you need to somewhat redesign what you're creating. 
Um, and a lot of companies are not able to do that. Uh, take a good example is the sneaker industry. Uh, very hard to use cradle-to-cradle -cradle methodology for a sneaker industry because they are, their whole process is to produce as many sneakers as cheaply and as quickly and efficiently as possible. So there are many areas in which cradle-to-cradle, -cradle, although the, some of the principles can be used, it's very hard to adopt as a wholesale um, methodology. So ISO 14000 is the globally recognized um, system which has a similar approach, which is to basically quantify everything. Uh, whether it's your water use, whether it's your energy inputs, whether it's the amount of um, acid smog you give off, whether it's the raw materials you use. And that's really the way in which most companies have used because it is um, perhaps simpler and less demanding because ISO 14000 can be used even if you have a terrible product. It'll just give you terrible numbers. Whereas Cradle to Cradle will say, if you, if you have a terrible product, you should do better. ISO 14000 doesn't tell you to do any better, it just tells you where you are. So ISO 14000 is a, is, a, is a standard which is being used increasingly by packaging, uh, chair manufacturers, um, people uh, making uh, milk bottles, and that, what I say, would probably be more widely used. But nothing really approaches cradle to cradle in terms of just, if we were to produce a completely sustainable society, cradle to cradle would be the, the, the methodology we would use. Um, this is a question from Francois. Going back to the, uh, the radiator with the beehive, um, I believe used as, as a heat sink. Donc pour revenir. Was using the bees to create the, the heat sink for the radiator, was that the most efficient way to, to create a heat sink for it? Or would, would engineering it um, with regard to the context that it's in, um, like as part of a car, be more efficient? I'm just curious why that, why the beehive is used. Did, did anyone hear that question? Yep, okay. So, uh, la question porte sur uh, l'utilisation de la ruche oui. et les, uh, le, la résolution des problèmes de la ruche. Est-ce que c'est la ruche qui uh, créait la chaleur pour créer la radiateur? Ou, uh, il, il ne voit pas très bien comment ça, ça marchait. Ah, D'accord. Ah. Euh, bon, je vais faire un petit cours de... L'apiculteur. Okay. Uh, I'll do. I'll give you a little beekeeping course. Euh, ce qui se passe, c'est qu'on donne des épreuves en, en cire. À l'intérieur, on, on, di on dispose à l'intérieur de la ruche mm -hmm. des épreuves en cire. We put uh, des formes. Fa uh, we put wax uh, shapes, wax forms first into the hive itself. Ça évite aux abeilles de créer de la, de la cire. This, what this does is it avoids having the bees themselves create wax. Et donc l'abeille en fait elle, elle étire euh, la, la, la cire pour former des espèces de murs. So the, the bee will um, uh, pull on uh, the wax in order to create a kind of wall. Voilà pour former toute tout cette cet ensemble de nids d'abeilles. And um, this is how they shape their honeycomb. Donc, elle, simplement, elle met en forme de la cire qui est déjà présente. So, um, she's working, the bee is working with a form which, is, all bees are feminine in French, um, is working with a form which is already present, already there. Je ne sais pas si j'ai répondu. Euh... Um, did I answer your question? Je pense que si je peux interpréter un petit peu, c'est que les abeilles créent cette structure. Donc ce sont les abeilles qui créent la structure. Est-ce que la raison pour ça, parce que les abeilles font la plus efficace et la plus efficace structure C'est la raison pour cela, et que les abeilles elles-mêmes font la meilleure structure, oui. la structure la plus efficace. Et que les humains, avec leurs computers, ne pourraient pas faire quelque chose de plus efficace. Et nous, les êtres humains, avec nos ordinateurs, nous ne serions pas en mesure de faire quelque chose d'aussi efficace. Um, C'est-à-dire qu'il y a un rapport à l'économie. Je um, dirais qu'il y a une relation à l'économie. To on, on peut arriver au même résultat. Vous pouvez arriver au même résultat. Sauf que les, les, les abeilles vont le faire en trois jours, donc... The only thing is, the bees can do the whole thing in three days. So, uh, sans que ça consomme aucune énergie. And it doesn't consume one wit of energy. Voilà. Uh, 
Et enfin voilà, moi dans mon travail, la, la question de l'énergie, elle est toujours euh, présente. In my work, the question of energy is always right in front of me. Et il est vrai que euh, les abeilles construisent naturellement des, des structures, des architectures extrêmement euh, euh, performantes. And it's true that uh, bees always are creating structures, architectures, which are uh, extremely high performance. Elles ont ça dans leur gène. Comment? Elles ont ça dans leur gène. It's in their genetic uh, codes. Okay, thank you. Yes. I'm trying in my head to name a lot of the design and manufacturing strategies that have been mentioned in the interest of creating sustainability as a way to try and extend the young woman's question about clothing. Mm -hmm. so in order to try and think of what strategies anyone who's creating any new material could bring to the process. Right? So Daphne mentioned upcycling. That's something designing beautiful clothing from vintage clothing instead. You know, using natural organisms to produce something, distributing and manufacturing locally. Can you summarize so that I can keep a kind of checklist in my head of some things that someone who was going to try and create a new sustainable material could have in their head? I think you've, you've answered the question pretty much um, pretty well in that obviously nature, um, uh, the reason why bi biomimicry and bionics exist is because nature has, nature produces no waste. Nature by natural selection has the most efficient way of doing whatever it does. So um, anything else that wasn't as efficient died out. So we have to assume that us as humans, um, any natural organism is the most efficient that's possible because everything else failed. So that of course is the great way to start any approach to sustainability is to look the way that nature has, has done it. Um, if you can't find an obvious solution for that, um, you know, an obvious way in which nature has approached it. To be honest with you, I think um, humans have, uh, in their production, humans have been um, relatively bad at doing sustainability. I think most of the approaches to sustainability that we have within industries, whether it's lead for buildings, um, whether it's uh, approaches by pack packaging engineers to reduce impact, have really been after a have been a very ineffective way of trying to solve the problem after they've already started. So, to be honest with you, um, you know, we always look to other, other, other industries. Who, how has sneaker design solved the problem? How has chair manufacturer designed a problem? And I think, uh, uh, solved, solved the problem. And I think the, the issue with that is always they're retrofitting it. So I think looking to nature is probably the best solution you can. Um, and there are websites out there that will actually do that for you. You put in a, um, I think, um, the Biomimicry Guild is a non-profit organization that they have a website. You type in your existing problem and they can tell you within the natural systems that occur within, um, the, the natural solutions that occur within, within nature, whether there's one out there that might help you think about the way in which you could uh, make your product or process more sustainable. Perhaps uh, anyone else got any comments about how to develop a sustainable process. Um. <laughs> uh, I, I would say uh, the point of having energy first and foremost in your mind is probably the most crucial. Um, I think you can always do a thermal, uh, thermal analysis of a situation and just ask yourself, how much energy am I going to put into this process versus what I get out? And um, like you said, nature is optimized. Minimal amount of energy for the maximum output. And it's probably the biggest, most important tenant in my mind. You know, I think coming from, I, I don't know if this is a, maybe it's just a philosophy, but having um, the people who are developing the product or making the product educated in, in, in sustainability as well. So they're every day thinking about, okay, well, how can I make this more efficient? How can I make this use less energy? I, I think a lot of um, improvement comes from having that, that education really at, at the forefront of your... Uh, I'll just, can I add to that? Yeah. Uh, I think one important part that people forget is in today's society, energy and money are decoupled. Uh, so it, it's quite easy to, to think because something is cheap, it doesn't have a lot of energy. Now, that problem may resolve itself when we run out of petroleum, but until that point, you really, you have to keep asking yourself that question because it's, it's easy to get suckered and say, this is cheap, so it must be easy to make. Okay. Um, 
just as a final wrap-up thought, when I first started um, and gave the introduction, I talked about the timeline of materials and talked about up until basically now and how we've, we've had a synthetic, um, uh, synthetic last 50, 60 years. Looking forward, looking to the future, I think um, biology is going to play an increasing role, and I think we've seen that with examples from Francois and, and Evan. Um, so I think perhaps our next century is going to be a biological one um, rather than a synthetic or oil-based one. But I also think that I, if you asked me five years ago whether I was um, optimistic about the use of materials in the future of the planet, I would have probably said no. Um, but now, um, having understood more about sustainability and, under, and meeting people who now also understand the principles of sustainability and are using it as part of uh, the products they produce, I think there is now so much greater understanding about, as I said, the impact of what you're doing, and I think that can only be a good thing. If everybody is equivalent to the three speakers here who have understood the systems, understood the impacts, understood the energy, if that is the uh, education and understanding of every product that we produce and going forward, I think we are going to solve, we're going to solve a lot of these problems just by, by that alone. So I think, for me, it's a very... Um, optimistic uh, future, at least in terms of materials and our understanding. Of course, we need to do this relatively quickly, um, but I think um, with our combined knowledge and obviously the thirst and desire to create products which do use those principles, I think I'm a lot more optimistic about uh, the sorts of materials, the sorts of products and the future that we have for, for design and materials. So I'd just like to finish with uh, thanking all the panels, um, all, all the panel, which is um, Eben, uh, Daphna and Francois, and also our translator as well. So if you would join me in, in thanking them for this presentation.